guys are joining us. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm the campus pastor here at our Aurora campus. Uh, man, we just love our online community. And one of the reasons why is because you can watch us from anywhere. Maybe you're here in Colorado, in the United States, or maybe even across uh, the ocean. Uh, man, we're just so glad that you're here. Would you leave us a comment down below? Let us know uh, where you're watching from. And hey, if you are local, I'm standing in our lobby at our Aurora campus. We have five locations across the Denver metro area in Lafayette, Longmont, Denver, Aurora, and West. Uh, we would love to see you at one of our physical locations. So come check us out. We would love to see you in person. And hey, would you do this for us? Would you share this video? Man, if you love what's happening here, if you're impacted in any way by today's service, uh, would you share and like this video? And if you haven't already, uh, would you subscribe to our YouTube page? We would love to stay connected with you as God continues to do amazing things here at Flatirons. Hey, we love you. So glad that you're here. Enjoy today's service.
sure I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must end It never do In faith So I throw up my hands I'll praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one move With my arms that's why Come on, shout it today I will worship you So I'll throw up my hands I'll praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah Come on, let's sing this over our lives today
God today. Give him some praise today. What a great reminder for you, for I, for the gratitude that we should have when we praise our God. You know, maybe you've walked into this room this morning feeling anything but that. Gratitude for how God is working in your life or maybe what he's done in the past. But can I encourage you this morning that our God is a God worth having gratitude and faith for and worth putting our hope in in the midst of any circumstance that we might face here today. You know, I was thinking earlier this week, I found myself using the word hope in a lot of ways where I didn't feel like it was giving the word its justice. I found myself saying, man, I hope it doesn't snow too much this week, or I hope my favorite team wins. But then we sing songs that talk about how our God is our living hope, and when we use the word in that tense, it gives the word a whole new meaning. It's less shallow than how we use it in our day-to-day -day talk. Isaiah 40 puts the idea of hope beautifully. It says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Maybe you find yourself here this morning faint or weary, but can I encourage you that when we sing things like our God is our living hope, that's a chance for us to put our faith and confidence in what our God can do in our life. So across this place, let's sing in confidence today as we declare that truth. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To where my Oh 
praise you today for the truth that you are our living hope. God, whatever stronghold that we've brought into this room this morning that we need hope in, God, we lay that at your feet for the truth that you are the same God who worked miracles in the past and you're still working today. God, we use a time like this and we gather like this to bring praise and honor to you. You deserve our full heart this morning. God, help all of us realize, God, that the hope that we might feel like we need to find, that we maybe turn to in different stages of life, God, that you're the answer, you're the way, you're the truth. God, we honor you today. We thank you, we praise you, and it's your son's name we pray. Amen, amen, Flatiron. Hey, so good to sing with you this morning. Hey, take a moment, say hi to somebody around you, give a high five a hug, tell somebody you're happy to see them, and then you can grab a seat. All right, all right. Well, hey, Flatirons, welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here that you're with us today. Hey, my name is Aaron. I'm one of the youth pastors here at Flatirons. And uh, let me just say, if you're new to Flatirons, welcome. We are so glad that you're here, that you're with us today. I wanna invite you to something we do every single week after our services called Discover. And really Discover is just a quick five-minute conversation where some of our staff can meet you, say hello, help answer questions, help you get connected with what's happening here at Flatirons. And so 
So if that's you, uh, come stop by, come say, hey, we'd love to talk to you after service today at Discover. Now listen, I, I know it's April. I know there's snow on the ground, which is crazy. So we're not really thinking about summer or you're really thinking about summer. It's like, come on, hurry up and get here. But summer's right around the corner, which means summer camp for our middle school and high school students is right around the corner. Now, parents, listen to me. We are like 90% full for camp, which is crazy for April. So if you were thinking, hey, I might be wait. I'm just going to wait till summer to get them signed up. You might, wanna, you might wanna change your thinking on that because they might not be able to make it to camp. We're filling up quick. We don't want your middle school, high school student to miss out on camp. So get them signed up today. You can do that on our website. You can find all the information at flatironschurch.com slash summer camp. Uh, or if you wanna come talk to some of our team out in the lobby, we'd love to answer any questions or do whatever we can to get your middle school and high school student at camp with us. It's gonna be a powerful, powerful week. It really will. Now, if you've been coming to Flatirons for a while, you know that really every year we partner uh, with a great organization in our community, in our city called Sister Carmen. And uh, what we do is we help Sister Carmen fill up their food bank uh, so that they can love and serve the people of our community, community, the people of our city. And so we have an opportunity to do that together as a church this next weekend. So we need your help. And uh, here's what we need. We need you to do some grocery shopping. We need you to do some shopping. And so when you leave today, uh, you'll see there's some shopping lists that you can grab to take with you or take a photo and uh, we just ask like as you do some of your shopping this week grab some of these extra items and bring it with you to church this next weekend so that we can help fill the food bank uh, for sister carmen really just help love and serve the community um, it's just a great opportunity for us as a church to love on the people here in lafayette and some of the cities around so we hope that you'll participate hope you'll be a part of that this next weekend uh, but hey I i'm really excited for today it's already been an incredible morning but we have a great message uh today from honestly one of my favorite preachers, one of my favorite people. He's an incredible, incredible man. And uh, fun fact about him, I think he's probably the only guy on our staff that could out bench press Jim Bergen. So, you know, he's like, he's got a lot going for him, uh, but he's got a great message for us today. Would you help me welcome up Ben Chavez? <laughs> hey, uh, <clears throat> Jesse DeYoung and I, as our executive pastor, work out together, and we were talking about this after the five o'clock. Let's just be clear on something, okay? For he and I both bench and squat, oh, we got him. Curls, I don't think we can keep up with Jim on curls, okay? Hey, glad to be with you this morning. Over the past several weeks, we've been jumping into this series called Alive. What this looks like for us is several weeks ago was Easter weekend where we saw 1,050 people get baptized across all of our campuses. Isn't that incredible? But for a lot of people, it was an opportunity. They were baptized or maybe they accepted Jesus for the first time before their baptism. They went home and then you go, well, now what? What's next? So we started talking about what this series could look like and what would it mean for us to parallel this series with a TV show called Alone. Any Alone fans out there? Yeah. Hey, shameless plug, pause. I wanna be on that show so bad. It's the end of bulking season. I got some extra like weight to lose. If you have connections, put me on that show. Okay, unpause back to the message. Now, in this show, you have these people that are dropped off at various locations. They're, they are allowed to bring 10 items that they get to pick, which they feel are essential to their survival. So in parallel for us in this series called Alive, what would it look like for us as believers to dive deep into 10 items that we feel are essential for us to making it and simply not just die? I think that's like the goal of alone is a little bit of like, I'm gonna outlast the other people and I've got the elements and all that, but like, how about I just don't die? Like, that's a little bit of the goal. Now, wouldn't that be an awful goal as a believer in in our faith? It's like, I just simply don't wanna spiritually die today, although some days that's how it feels. But what our goal is, is we wanna move into a place of what does it look like for us to actually thrive beyond just surviving? What would it look like for us to dive into some of these things to go, hey, if I follow these 10 essential items and listen to God's word and I follow the Holy Spirit, how can I move to the next level in my faith? And so week one, Jim had an opportunity to teach to us and we dove into Acts chapter two as an introduction to the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter two, we went through some stuff with these challenge cards. Now each week when you walk in, you get a challenge card. And every week when you walk out, you're gonna get a new one to follow for that week. And so week one, we jumped into this item, which out of the 10 was our compass or our why. And there's three phrases or three words that were on there that you were to write down on your card to start realizing what is my why, what is my compass? And those items and those things were your vision, intent, and strategy. So on my card, on the seventh, I wrote, my compass or my wise to be a better man, more so than I could be on my own, but only through the power of a relationship with Jesus. That was my vision, my intent. More patience. Any other fathers or parents in the room can say amen to that one? Y'all gonna have to give me some more feedback today. We might be here for a minute. 
to be more patient, how to love and lead unconditionally despite what others may do, because then I would realize that I'm enough for my wife, my kids, friends, and for this church. And my strategy was to be in his presence more, which led us into week two. And in week two, Jesse got up and we dove a little bit more into the Holy Spirit and actually who the Holy Spirit is, what he does, and also what he is not. So we know that the Holy Spirit is not the force uh, from Star Wars, okay? But the Holy Spirit actually does a few things for us, and here's what they are. Holy Spirit encourages, gives gifts, guides, and intercedes for us. Now know that in Scripture, Peter was right alongside Jesus, but his life didn't truly change until Jesus left and the Holy Spirit was left to partner with him. So you have a card in week two, and uh, we believe in being raw and real here, and, uh, uh, and I'm a baseball player at heart, so I missed Monday and Tuesday out of my seven day challenge. So five for seven is a pretty good batting average, okay? But what we looked at is if you wanna encounter the Holy Spirit, you need to take some opportunity to sit yourself still for just a few minutes and actually listen. To foster an opportunity to where the Holy Spirit can speak. So I missed Monday and Tuesday, well there's my card, okay? And then diving into week three, that item, sorry, that item in week two was fire the Holy Spirit. And into week three, the item that we're gonna look at is this concept of shelter. Now, for paralleling this with the verse, shelter can completely change a situation depending on the setup. Now, several years ago, one of my hobbies in life and one of the things that I feel like I am honestly the most connected to God is to hunt. Any hunters out there in this world? Anybody feel uncomfortable when I say that phrase? Okay, listen, if that is you, that's okay. You've just never tasted elk before, all right? Yeah, amen to that. And if it really makes you uncomfortable, feel free to send me an email. It's Jim Bergen at flatironchurch.com. <laughs> I'm gonna get back to you really promptly with a full explanation of how I feel. So about eight years ago, I had an opportunity to go to my best friends on an elk hunt up in the mountains. And we did everything right. We got on the herd, we knew we were gonna be, and we went back to base camp, and we had this amazing canvas tent set up, this cast iron stove, weather was perfect, like hoodie weather, it was so nice. We ate, we went to sleep, got in our sacks and in the cots, and, uh, and, and truly felt like this is a core memory moment for us. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, about two o'clock in the morning, this windstorm from hell came and the flute from the cast iron stove was facing the wind that the wind, the way the wind was blowing. And we literally got woken up by a bright light in the tent. Now, when we sat up the second time the bright light happened, what was happening is the wind was blowing through the flute, out the cast iron stove and like a dragon's breath, fire was getting blown back into this space and the walls began to shake. And I don't think you have ever seen three full grown men act like five-year-old boys in your life. Out of the cots, running around, holding up the walls. That was all night. Let me just tell you this. Survival was the goal until light happened that next morning. We get up, we get ready to go and everybody's like, how are you doing? I'm like, I don't know, we made it. I feel like that's pretty good. So for us, Shelter can completely change a situation because I don't know what it looks like for you, but sometimes in life it just feels like we are trying to survive, especially spiritually. Now I don't know what it is like for you or what's going on outside of these walls, but when you walk through those doors today, some of you are in the middle of survival mode. Some of you are facing a possibility of divorce. You look across at your spouse and you don't know who they are. Maybe you're facing bankruptcy. Maybe you go, no one at my school likes me, my teachers hate me, I can't make grades, I can't make the team. Maybe you feel like when you walk into the work workplace, everybody looks at you, turns sideways and goes to a different room. I don't know the battles that you're facing. But I do know that life is really hard. Now that's not mind blowing. But you know what I do know? God is also really good. I think as believers we justify it and we say, man this is really hard, but you know what? but God is good. Why don't we change our language up and go, you know what, we can acknowledge that life is really hard and God is good. Because I think the goal for us is to move to this. It's to move, it's, sorry, it's a time for us to thrive and not just survive. You like my word play there this morning? Now listen, there is only one scenario that that is not true, and it is if you're raising children under the age of five in your home, then surviving and thriving is the exact same thing. Anybody in the trenches with me? It's like you woke up the next morning, you're like, well, we're awake, I guess we're thriving. But as believers, our goal has to be more than just to not die. It's gotta be to move towards a place of survival. And if you have your Bibles and your smartphones, we're gonna be jumping into John chapter eight this morning. If you don't have a Bible at any one of our campuses, all in the back there are Bibles for you to use. So I want you to jump into John chapter eight with me this morning. Now, shelter 
is our, is our item today? And what does it mean for us to shelter? And what is it actually rooted in our faith? That essential item is the word of God. Now, I don't know what home was like for you or how you grew up, but for me, we had a plethora, like that phrase, a plethora of Bibles in our house. Anybody else grow up like that? You had Big Bertha on the dining room table. You know what I'm saying? It's like, and you open it up. Then everybody had their own Bible or you had different translations. Now, granted, I grew up a pastor's kid. Now, the right kind of pastor's kid. I wanna honor my father's name. I have very fond memories of as a little kid going and, dra- I say fond, dragging my sleeping bag to 5 a.m. prayer with my parents as a little kid. And I would sleep in the back because I'm not holier than thou and the parents would pray. It may still be that way today, okay? But I had an amazing, I have amazing parents. I have amazing mentors in my life that truly, like as I grew up, taught me what it's like to have an authentic and a real relationship with Jesus and not a religious relationship with Jesus. Can I get an amen this morning? I think so many of us in this room are over religion, but we are so for Jesus and a relationship with him and a relationship with his people. But when life gets really hard, how do we simply not just try not to die, but how do we begin to thrive? And truly, we looked into what it means to have the Holy Spirit guide us, but really what we believe is an essential item for us, and that's this book. This is where it starts. So in John chapter eight, verses 31 through 32, it reads this way. And this is where we're gonna camp out for a minute. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I want us to underline a word and we're gonna stick here for just a second. And it's the word abide. What does it mean to abide in his word? Now, very simply put, the word abide means to follow deeply or to rest to be at complete peace. And I don't know if you've been in a scenario like I have before, but to be in the middle of chaos and be still and at peace, that only comes from one place. That comes from the power of the Holy Spirit and a deep-rooted faith in his word. Now, the disciples followed his teaching every single day, but what does it look like today for us as we dive into scripture to truly abide or to shelter in the word of God? Because according to this verse, if we abide in his word, We shelter in it, we're gonna know truth, and truth is gonna set us free. Now, what does this mean? It's gonna set us free from a life of religion, from a life of guilt. It's gonna set us free from sin. It's gonna set us free from um, heavy oppression or addiction or whatever you may be walking in through through those doors today. Because some of you, like me, were really good at playing the church game when those doors open up. To putting on the face, to putting on the smile, but there are never fights in your world like there are fights in your family on the way to church. The same as that family photo that sits above your fireplace with everybody with the pretty smile and all of us know 15 seconds before, mom is going, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Smile, you know that. We do, we do a great job at playing the church game, but truth is, is life is really difficult and it's really hard and God is really good. So for us to abide in his word, for us to shelter in it, we wanna start with the understanding that the Holy Spirit guides us, but truly what we believe here as a church of Flatirons and our number one value is biblical authority. Or we say it like this, a better way to do life. When we truly submit ourselves to God's word, this leads us and guides us in a better way. And who doesn't want a better life? Now, we're not talking prosperity gospel, but we're talking wisdom and guidance and a way for us to live in the middle of this world. To whatever you may be struggling with, whatever you may be going through, you can pull from this book and truly be at peace and at rest. Listen, it's like this. This is why we wrestle with this thing together and why we do groups and why we have this room of people with different backgrounds because even though that is my story with my parents and how I was growing up and mentors that taught me the right way, for some of you, that couldn't be further from the truth or from your reality. So how is it, for those of you that have that background and somebody like me that has mine, we can still wrestle with this book together and it's called Perspective. Because even though I study and do this for a living, I've done it for 13 years, the likelihood that if I read a verse on my own and try to understand its intent on my own, I very well might miss, the like, might miss what it was intended for me to understand. 
But if you get a room of us together all reading the same verse, the reality is, is we're not gonna probably miss what God intended. Just like a really good coach that looks at a player, I'm a sports guy at heart, I've got my chair at home, I love watching the game, I won't tell you my teams because I don't want, you to, I don't want to lose you today, okay? It's not the Broncos. I'm from Texas. Oh, some size great, I lost you. Those of you, there's the door, you can come back when Jim's back, I don't know. <laughs> But in the sports world, if you have a good coach and he's got a player that goes five for 10 from the free throw line, that player you would say is very average. But a good coach goes to the player and says, hey, tomorrow after practice, we're gonna work on your shot. Single coach with a single player might catch some of the things he's doing wrong, but very well, even if he's a good coach or she is, might miss what the player is doing wrong. Now, the same scenario, that coach goes, hey, tomorrow after practice, myself and the assistants are gonna work on your shot. Now, if you have multiple eyes on a situation together, they're probably not gonna miss what that player is doing wrong. So what does it actually look like for us to be a body of believers? It means that we open up God's word together. It means we read it together, and it means we wrestle with it together. In a non-religious spirit, free from guilt or shame or whatever sin you may be carrying, recognizing that God is good and his word is good and life is hard. But together, it gets a little bit easier. You agree with that this morning? Now listen, sometimes life is gonna throw you really hard, difficult curveballs. Things that you didn't anticipate or understand where they came from or you may ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And I don't know. And I'm never gonna be the pastor that's gonna stand up here and be able to give you a theological reason why that's the case. I do know, though, that God is good in the middle of that. And when you are deeply rooted into God's word, then you have an opportunity to make it with a different mindset and carry a different hope. I wanna introduce you to somebody today. Her name is Kim. And here in just a few seconds, you're gonna get to hear her story. Now, life threw Kim a really big, difficult curveball. But Kim was deeply rooted in the word of God and in her faith, and it changed her circumstance. Why don't you take this out? It was like being in a hurricane. You have all this stuff going on around you, but at the center of a storm, the eye of the hurricane, you have stillness and calm. And for me, that's what this last year was like. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything and the one who makes me who I am. I think of the verse, he brings joy in the morning. Every day has the promise of blessings and new beginnings, and I thank God for the blessings that he has for me today, because even on my worst days, I know he has good things for me. My first job out of college was working on bone marrow transplant and sitting bedside with families having to make the very difficult decision of turning off the machines and withdrawing care. And it's such a different feeling when you're in the room with a family and they don't have faith and the grief that they're experiencing is for them, this is the end. It's very different than when I'm in a room and we are praying that patient out. There is grief and there is loss in the room, but there is this hope because we know it's not the end of the story. My initial diagnosis was February 7th. The day that I found out I was not stage one, I was stage three, was um, April 4th. That was the darkest most devastating day in my life when we realized um, this was gonna be a much bigger deal than any of us had thought. The hardest part is <laughs> just seeing someone that you love Go through it and there's nothing you can do. So that's the hardest part, right? I can't do anything other than be there. So that's kind of what you do. My heart just broke for my husband, for my children, and my friends. I really appreciate it. 
um, seeing the strength of your faith while also showing, hey guys, here's the ache of it all and <laughs> it's real. In some ways, it's harder for the person who's sitting in the chair than the person who's laying in the bed. Thank you for the opportunity to be witnesses front row to what you do in their lives. You feel like the bottom has sort of dropped out from under your feet in your world. And the only thing that was gonna keep me grounded was my faith in who God says he is and that in all things that God is good and that he loves me and wants good things for me. That's what gave me hope. That's what gave me peace. Um, that's what gave me comfort. I've always believed that if you truly trust in God's plan for you, the good plan, right? That no matter what happens, he's got a plan, right? And so if you have truly that perspective, you can't get angry because he's in control. Cancer strips away so much from you. There's a lot of losses, but what it can't take away is my identity in Christ. There's been so many mornings where I've been crying because I wake up and, you know, my face is wet with tears from the losses and from the challenges that I still deal with. And I love the verse in Psalms that David says that God keeps track of our sorrows, that he records them, and that he keeps my tears in a jar. It so moves me that the creator of the world cares enough about what I'm going through that he's tracking this and he is keeping my pain. And I believe in God's economy, pain is never wasted. It's always used and redeemed. People will say to me all the time, you know, you're so strong, you got this. But I can't sustain that on my own. I am not that strong. But I have a strong God, and he's got me. <laughs> Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Philippians 4.13. watched that several times this week and every time I watch it, it, and it tugs on my heartstrings because I know for some of you that's your story. Maybe for some of you that was your week. We don't know when life's curveballs are gonna come at us and they're gonna be hard and they're gonna be difficult. If you haven't encountered them, I'm not prophesying over you, but you're probably gonna come up against a storm. So what does it look like for us to thrive or what John 10.10 10 calls an abundant life as a believer? Six years ago, I had an opportunity to teach on John chapter 13 and the storms of life. And I remember as this very naive young pastor telling God, I don't know that I've really gone through a lot of storms, God. Am I qualified to teach on this? Stupidest thing I could have told God. <laughs> like six months later is what we call like stuff hit the fan and it was a really difficult next five years. I look back and go, I should have just like told Jesus, I don't know what it's like to experience true wealth, Lord, and preach prosperity gospel or something. <laughs> You know, like life is really hard and God is really good. So when we jump into scripture today and we try to move from this place of survival to thriving so we can abide in his word and we can shelter in it and move towards this abundant life, I wanna give you three things today that have genuinely changed the way that I've encountered God's word and have helped me in this life, okay? So here's the first one. This is what we say here. The Bible was written for us, but not to us. Meaning this, we understand it today in our context, but if you see through the eyes of the people that it was written to, it brings an extra layer of depth and power to us. Now, there's a great teacher, his name's Ray Vanderlaan. In fact, he's one of my favorite teachers, and he does a great job of connecting the dots between us today and the Jewish people and who the Bible was written to. He calls it, as we say the Bible was written for us, not to us, he says this, it is Western thinking versus Eastern thinking. Okay, and he gives us some examples, and I want you to see the difference in these, two ver in these two versions. So a Western mind, or us today, looks at information about God where an Eastern mind wants to know God. 
Information versus knowing. Western mind describes things abstractly. God is love. God is om- omnipotent. He is good and he's just. Where an Eastern mind would say this, it's, it describes things concretely. God is my rock. God is my fortress. He is my shepherd. A Western mind says, if I can get in your head, I may capture your heart. Where an Eastern mindset says this, if I can reach your heart, your head will follow. And today's preachers will say this when I'm done teaching. It sounds something similar to go, do you believe this? To where an Eastern rabbi at the time will say, will you practice this? Seeing the difference between the two. Now, I don't know if you understand, you knew this, this is new to me, but 70% of the Bible is written in story. Why? Because it was written for an Eastern audience versus us today. One of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible actually is a perfect example of when we look through the eyes of who it was written to, it brings an extra layer of depth to us. Okay, so you have your Bibles and you wanna turn to, we're gonna turn to Psalm 23, and I'm sure a lot of you have this verse memorized. You probably looked it up, grabbed the background, made it your screensaver, memorized it early on in your faith because it brings comfort to us. But we're gonna read this together, okay? So in Psalms 23, it says this. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? It's an amazing, powerful verse. But for us, when we hear, and the verse I want you to think about is you make me lie down in green pastures, this is what we picture. These luscious Kentucky bluegrass green fields with a shade tree. Listen, I don't know if you've ever experienced in this life I have as a hunter. There is nothing like a late afternoon nap under a shade tree. Any hunters know what I'm talking about? The rest of you, you're missing out. I'm praying for you, okay? But that's what we picture. Why? Because that's what our mind sees. Can I show you? What shepherds and the people of the Bible picture when they say, you make me lie down in green pastures, this is what they think. It's very different. Now, when it rains in the Middle East and where the Israeli shepherd boys would take their sheep, it is so dry that when moisture hits the ground, nothing can grow. And the only place that grass will grow is when rain hits a hard surface like a rock, cascades down the side, and forms a pool at the bottom to create these little tufts of grass. Now, when you tell God, Lord, I am in the middle of a storm, make me lie down in green pastures, if it isn't perfect, like the first picture, we feel like God hasn't met what we have asked. But when we see it through the mind of who the Bible was written to, and we recognize that we say, God, make me lie down in green pastures, Lord, get me from clump of grass to clump of grass to empty field to empty field. Think about the sheep there. They're literally taking bites of grass with dirt all around their mouth. Now we're asking God, Lord, make me lie down in green pastures and sustain me for what I need today. Do you see when we recognize that the Bible was written for us but not to us, it adds another layer for you. Now when God gives you what you need today, you're grateful versus questioning if he's done enough for you. Listen, church, if we're to abide and to shelter in his word, we gotta see it the way it was intended. Because now all of a sudden, in the middle of your storm, you may have a glimpse of hope, and now you have peace because he is letting you lie down in green pastures. And the second thing I want you to look at and what's been really powerful for me, so the first is the Bible is written for us, but not to us. And the second is we're gonna learn this phrase today. I wanna teach you this. I want you to read the red. When I was a little kid, I told you I grew up and I still have amazing parents and I would drag my sleeping bag to early morning prayer. And I remember as a middle school, high school kid, I went to my dad and I asked the question, how do I know if, I have, if I'm hearing God or if it's just like the questions or the words that are rolling up in my own head? Anybody been there before? How do I know if I'm catching the will of God? Now, I'm not, I don't know. I'm like middle school and high school. I was probably wanting to find out like something stupid, like should I ask a girl out or not? Like, I don't know. But I remember looking at my dad and asking that question and he goes, you have your Bible? And I go, yeah. He goes, open it up. And he said, all throughout the New Testament are words that are written in red, and those are the very words of Jesus. So begin to read the red, and you're gonna get to know his voice. Listen, we all have smartphones today, and when somebody calls, there's a thing called caller ID that pops up, and it's a picture, or it's a name, 
And if you're like me, that's the only phone calls that I answer. And if it's a number that I don't know, it goes straight to voicemail. Anybody follow me on that? Anybody goes, no, I have to answer those. I am praying for you, okay? But there are certain people in your life that when that phone rings, you can pick it up without looking at caller ID and by the very sound of their voice, you know exactly who's on the other end. For some of you, you've spent a numb time with, like me, with my wife. I can tell by the very breath that she takes, the way that she laughs, the way she calls, or says my first name alone, I know it's her. Why? Because I have spent countless amount of hours getting to know what her voice sounds like. Some of you are questioning whether you have heard God, but you haven't spent any hours listening to God's voice. Because this is by nature what we do today. You go, God, I need your guidance, I need your wisdom. Will you help me understand what decision I want you to be a part of my life? And it's coming from an authentic and true heart, but this is what you do. Okay, Lord, I'm gonna sit still and I'm gonna listen for your voice. God, it's been a whole 15 seconds and I haven't heard you yet. Did you really hear my prayers? Like we want God to answer like we're a microwave generation that we need to hear it right now. But you can't get familiar with a shelter or know how to abide in it if you know nothing about it and you're not familiar with it. Because what is amazing about it when we read the red is we understand that just as badly as we wanna know who God is, God wants to know us too. So in Matthew chapter four, verse four, which is a parallel to Luke 4, 4, reads this way. It says, but he answered, it is not written, man shall live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Those words that are underlined there, depending on the Bible that you have, you can get in your smartphones too, are actually letters that are in red, red ink. Those are his words. We shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You wanna thrive as a believer and not just purely not try to die? How about you hang on every word that he says? Some of you, before you got married, when you were dating, you hung on every word of that person that you were interested in. But we don't do that with God. The creator of the universe that genuinely wants to spend time with us, that's sitting there and waiting. Another passage of scripture is Revelation chapter three, verse 20. Here's some more red ink. It says this, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. The creator of the universe is sitting there waiting for you to open the door. Now, can God go anywhere and do anything? Yes, but guess what? God is also polite. And he won't go where you don't invite him. I want to challenge us as a church. If we want to learn how to truly thrive in this, to have an abundant life in the middle of our storms, because that's reality. The truth for us is this. We have to know his words because we have to be able to pull from something. We're in the middle of our storms. That's one of the most incredible parts about Kim's story is how many scriptures and verses she had stored up in her heart and her faith became her rock. Truly, I'm telling you this, no matter what you've walked through with those, in, into here with, through those doors with, I'm telling you this, God's good and his word is enough. Just rely on it. Why can't we just simply read the words and do what it says? Why do we have to overcomplicate our faith? Why do we have to all of a sudden listen to all these other voices in our lives that have told us certain things about this when we haven't read it for ourselves? Listen, in this world, here's reality. You and I can have an argument and I can be completely wrong, 100% wrong. And I can say, forget you, leave, go on the internet and find 10,000 people that will validate my truth even though I am wrong. Are you catching that? But there is one place and one place alone that is full of absolute truth, and it is his word. Despite what we may be saying in politics or what you see on social media or what your friends may be telling you, whatever their truth is, if it doesn't line up with this truth, is not truth. But you won't know truth if you don't know his word. You want to know his voice? Start reading the red ink. You're struggling. You need guidance. Read his voice. You need comfort? Read his voice. So one, the Bible was written for us. It wasn't written to us. And here's the second one. 
is, is that we want to understand that we begin to read the red. And finally, it's this, that God's word is a Swiss army knife. As a kid, if you grew up like me, that is one of my favorite gifts that I ever received as a little kid. It's that red Swiss army knife. Any other fellows in the room or ladies know what I'm talking about? The moment you got that thing, you instantly, as a little kid, I went, what can I take apart and what can I fix? <laughs> my poor parents, there are so many items in my house that were then just like taken apart or cut up and were never put back together. <laughs> But that Swiss army knife as a little kid, I went, this thing can do anything. God's word is no different. Whatever scenario you may have, whatever you may be going through, God's word is applicable to your lives. One of my favorite verse that helps us understand this is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. It says this, all scripture is, God, is breathed out of, uh, by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be, be, be complete, equipped, lacking nothing. Now, I want you to catch this first. All scripture is God breathed. There's a vein of teachers today that tell you just camp out on the New Testament. No, no, no. I'm following what God's word actually says and I'm taking Genesis to Revelation and I'm using this whole book to guide me. But he gives a very clear depiction as there's four ways that God's word is good for us. And the first is this, it's for teaching. It's so that we can deeply begin to understand whatever scenario you may be going with, that there is something that we can learn from here. But teaching means this, means you have to spend time consuming it so you can understand it. Now, you may not know everything about it, but we can sure get familiar with it. And guess what? I'm the pastor that you go, hey, I just, I need some wisdom. What verse says that? And I go, I don't know, but I think I know what it says. I can't, I don't know the reference. Let's Google together. Thank God we live in that day and age. I'm not gonna be that pastor that stands here before you and go huh, pull 15 verses out of the top of my head and know the reference. But I know what God's word says because I've stored it up in my heart. Why can't it be any difference for us? So teaching is the first place. That God's word is good for teaching so that we can begin to grow. The next is this, it's called reproof. That word simply means small minor corrections and adjustments. Small minor moments that we just go, hey, I'm just a little bit off track. I'm gonna realign with God's word. The third one is this correction. This is a little bigger. This means you're genuinely off track. This means that you begin to live and think in lies that have been laying in your head and you've listened to begin to the voice of the enemy or Satan or sometimes some friends that have, should have never given you wisdom. Correction and what God's word should do for us is it helps us in those moments get, to, get us back on track before the very things that we have done in our life, we reap the consequences of what we have sowed. Listen, I want us to get so familiar that this is word that we get to that place ever before we need correction. And the fourth phrase is this, training in righteousness. That word training means that it is an ongoing process for you and I to the end of our age. Listen, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna burst your bubble. You're never gonna make it as a believer and you're never gonna be perfect. But guess what? I'm okay with that. But it just simply means we have to change our mindset to go, you know what? Today, and tomorrow and the next day, I'm gonna focus on what growth can look like in minimal steps. Because if you focus and you follow God's word and you understand it is clump of grass to clump of grass, then you recognize that it is each day, one step after another, after another. And before you know it, you can look back and you are so grateful that you are not the person that you used to be. Any amens to that? It's amazing when we actually dive into God's word and recognize that we're just taking steps daily. That way when you fall or when you falter, which all of us are going to, and you take some steps back, you're still further than where you started. But it's a journey, singled every single day, sorry, a journey that we take every single day towards righteousness so that we can be complete, lacking nothing. Another thing that scripture is amazing for and is truly a guide for us is in Psalm 119, 105, and it reads this way. It says this, your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Listen, this is true. As a middle school and high school kid, I would, this is an actual true story, which they're all true stories. I don't know why I have to preface, just so you know. <laughs> don't think on that too long. I would actually take my Bible. This is real. And I go, God, I need wisdom. And you name the scenario or whatever. And I would throw my Bible up, let it land, fall open. I would run over and I would stick my finger on a verse and go, okay, God, magic eight ball, answer my, oh, that's 
No, it has nothing to do with what I just asked. Because I don't know if you're like me, but Genesis chapter 25 through Genesis chapter 50, which is the genealogy, doesn't quite hit home when you need guidance. Can we stop treating this word like a magic eight ball just to think it's there to give us answers? No, this is a guide so that we can begin to make right choices and move towards a proper direction and it's to represent who Jesus is, not because religion says so, but because we have a relationship with him and a relationship with his people. Listen, and here's facts. If you're dealing with guilt, if you're dealing with shame, there's a verse for you. If you're dealing with anxiety, there's a verse for you. If you need joy, if you're feeling creative, there's a verse for you somewhere in there. But here is the truth. There is also, guys, a book called The Song of Solomon. And if you need a one-liner for your wife, it's in there. This whole book is this uh, letter between Solomon and his bride, and they exchange these things back and forth. But I need you to understand something. Remember point number one, the Bible was written for us and not to us. So guys, I don't, encourage you to repeat some of the phrases and call your wife a heifer or a goat, it's probably not gonna get you where you thought it was gonna get you. But listen, God's word is true and it is good and when we follow it, life gets better. My wife and I were talking this week about um, what I was teaching on and she uh, told me a really cool story. I actually had heard this from her before. She said, Ben, do you remember when I felt like death was at our doorstep? I talked about some of the heavy moments that she had experienced in life. And I said, yeah, she goes, there was a night where I woke up out of breath, but as I sat up, these words were leaving my mouth. And it's this verse, it's Hebrews chapter 12, sorry, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So, you know, we were in a really difficult season. Because my wife had, her, had God's word stored up on her heart, that's what she sat up saying. Can we get to a place where we know God's word like that? That no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with, we can take this item called God's word in our shelter and we can abide in it, we can follow it, and we can truly be at rest and at peace. Because I don't know what, you, what you're coming in with, but I do know what you can walk out with and it's called hope. And it only comes from a place of knowing his words, which comes from that word of God in that book. So here's your challenge this week. Hopefully you grabbed a challenge card and you'll walk in. If not, get one on your way out. There are seven verses on this challenge card for you today. There are verses that have to do with strength, strength, focus, direction, connection, resilience, encouragement, and insight. And your challenge this week is we're going old school and I want you to pick one of those seven verses and I want you to memorize that verse. So you don't have to Google, you don't have to look it up. I want you to put it in the mirror in your bathroom, on your dashboard, as the background on your phone or on your computer, wherever you need to do to see it repeatedly. And I want you to pick one verse so that we can begin to store God's word in our heart and we can begin to build this shelter so we can abide and rest in it fully. Because I believe that God's word is the ultimate authority and will help us understand that it is a better way to do life when we follow it. Church, I believe in you so much and I know God has, has intentions and plans that are good for you. And even in the middle of your storm, recognize God is still good and his word is enough. So I'm gonna pray for you and I'm gonna pray that whatever you've walked in with, that God steps into that. I wanna challenge you this week to dive into his word and begin to rest in the hope that comes with it. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you bless us with, God. Thank you for the opportunity that we have, God, to study from your word, to learn from it, God, and that we can begin to shelter and rest in it. God, that we can abide in it, God, so that we can be full of truth, and that truth brings freedom, God. Freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from a legalism or religious spirit, God. And God, that we can step towards a thing called hope, which we find in your word that pushes, pushes us towards a genuine, authentic, real relationship with you. And I pray for every single person in this room, and God, whatever they walked in with, I pray that they would leave full of hope, knowing that you are good in the middle of our storms and your word is enough. I thank you that we got to worship together today and we thank you for your spirit and your presence. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Let's stand and worship together.
discover by the info desk in the lobby we'd love to get you connected we'll see you guys next time